Hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. An individual's health, wellness, and quality of life are greatly impacted by how they are able to manage their pain. Today we will discuss the different types of pain and how it can better be managed in the home care patient. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Best Practices for pain, Patients with Pain. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during the broadcast. Our phone number and email address are on the screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheets, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for today's program for nurses and social workers, as well as nurse practitioner pharmacology credit. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While the content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will be awarded for one year for nurses expiring on May 31, 2016, and two years for social workers expiring on May 31, 2017. I'm Jacqueline Giddens, nurse with the Bureau of Home and Community Services, and with me today is Nancy Bishop, the Assistant State Pharmacy Director, and Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director, and we also have as a taped uh, presentation uh, today, Lisa Martin, who is with the uh, Bureau of Home and Community Services. Thank you and welcome to our program. Ready? Okay. Today we will be discussing the topic of pain. It's very common, yet is one that we may need additional education or we may need an update. So that is why we're discussing pain today. Pain is so significant that it's now termed the fifth vital sign. And this is according to the Department of Veterans Affairs, VNAA, and the American Pain Society. As I said, the pain is the fifth vital sign and must be assessed at each visit. Clinicians' failure to assess for pain is considered a major barrier to the relief of pain. When patients fail to report their pain, they also cause a barrier to the relief of their pain. So what is pain? Pain is considered an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience which may be associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Pain may also be an emotional experience for our patients. Pain may be caused or experienced by the potential tissue damage or injury, and this is considered neuropathic pain. And you see that I mentioned that it may be an emotional experience, and it, even the potential for tissue damage can cause pain for some patients. Why do we experience the feeling of pain? Well, many nerve receptors or neuroreceptors within our body react to painful stimuli. These receptors send a message or a pain signal to our brain via the spinal column after we come in contact with a perceived painful stimuli. And you see on the slide I have here for you the, the, the passageway that we feel pain. The location in the brain where the nerve fibers end will affect how an individual perceives and reacts to pain. So the types of pain that we'll discuss today are acute, and that is pain that is considered short-term, usually from an easily identifiable source. Examples include surgery, an injury, or an acute condition, and the duration for acute pain is usually less than three months. Chronic pain may begin as an acute pain, but then it lingers. Chronic pain lasts longer than what is considered usual for a specific condition, surgery, or an injury. An individual may develop chronic pain syndrome, which is pain that is worse than is customary or the, for the injury or condition, and is, is a result of chronic pain. So you may develop a chronic pain syndrome as a result of this chronic pain. So there are potentiating factors for the development of chronic pain syndrome, and these are chronic diseases such as cancer, arthritis, fibromyalgia, 
painful muscle contractions or injury to the nervous system, psychological conditions such as depression, anxiety, or others, or untreated or undertreated acute pain. And you see on the slide I have that underlined because that is a major uh, develop causes the development of chronic pain syndrome is when our patients go untreated or undertreated for their acute pain. Our goal will be to minimize the uh, or prevent the chronic pain syndrome from developing. So the types or sources of pain, so we had acute and uh, a chronic pain and then we also have the sources or other types of pain and we'll discuss those. And to begin with, we'll talk about carpal tunnel syndrome. It is uh, where a nerve in the wrist is compressed, causing pain. Uh, many times there's no known cause, but it can be caused from repetitive use. And then there's abdominal pain, sometimes described as mild stomach aches or stomach cramps. Hip pain, and we see this a lot in our elderly patients, from falls, arthritis, wear and tear chronic knee and joint pain, and that again from arthritis and other chronic diseases such as degenerative joint disease and excess weight. Back pain from range, range from muscle strains, kidney disorders, bone pains, cancer, arthritis and degenerative joint disease, chronic neck and shoulder pain, and that can come from overexertion, computer use, sleeping incorrectly, arthritis, joint disease, other disease processes that we talked about such as fibromyalgia. And on the slide here I put uh, trigger points for testing for fibromyalgia. I just put that there as a reference for you. You can see all the tr trigger points and that's where uh, when a clinician presses on that area it causes pain. So lots of times when a patient is being diagnosed with fibromyalgia the physician or the nurse practitioner will assess those areas to determine uh, if they have fibromyalgia. Then there's whiplash and that is often seen from car accidents uh, and chronic neck pain and shoulder pain. Chronic muscle pain comes from improper use or overuse. Trigeminal neuralgia is face pain and that is from the cranial nerve 5 damage or irritation. You see that with tooth infections uh, or damage, TMJ, and sinus infections. And I just put a picture for you there on the slide of the trigeminal nerve and see all the areas that it affects, the whole face uh, there in that picture. And we also see this in our, a lot of our patients as shingle pain, uh, also known as post-herpatic neuralgia. Some patients never have complete pain relief after having shingles. Uh, sometimes it, it may be six months, a year, or never have relief. And um, now, you know, there's a Zost Zostavax that is prescribed for our patients. Usually started out at age 60. Now they're recommended it as early as age 50 to help uh, with the occurrence of shingles and then thereafter the pain. Sciatica pain, rear or leg muscle pain, especially noted when sitting for long periods of time, climbing stairs, walking, or running. And then we have the spinal pain that is inflamed tissue surrounding the spinal column or spinal cord. And this can be caused from injury, infection, dies from tests like myelograms, chronic compression of the spinal column, or a complication of spinal surgery. And then we also have phantom pain, and used to, uh, we would hear it termed phantom leg pain. But the newer term, or the more accurate term, would be phantom pain. And this is pain felt in any extremity or removed body part, even after the extremity is gone. So amputated or removed, and it can be mild or extreme, and I've read a lot of literature on this. and. Uh, some of our patients that may have had breast pain after they've had their breast removed or uh, they'll still have pain there and so you may see this term is phantom pain. So then there's diabetes related nerve pain and that's a neuropathy. 
uh, occurs with nerve damage. It makes, they may experience pain especially at night. And then depression, anxiety, and pain cause pain or make the existing pain worse. So when our patients are not treated for their depression or anxiety, their pain can be much worse. Psychogenic pain and headaches are a common pain reported with psychogenic pain. So you may see that. And then we have compartment syndrome, and that is pressure buildup from swelling, bleeding, and it's usually after surgery, can be uh, after a fracture. And the most common sites are the legs, arms, and abdomen. And I have on the slide for you uh, examples of the compartments. And you can see on the left are the compartments. And then on the right is com what develop, they develop compartment syndrome. And this is of the leg. And you can see the swelling that causes pressure and then pain. A lot of people might not consider the different compartments of the body and of the leg, and you can see very well the d division of the compartments. And then when you have swelling, it doesn't take much, and then you have, can have really bad pain for our patients. Here's a picture of an abdomen, the other common site for compartment syndrome. And you can imagine the pain that this patient must feel uh, due to compartment syndrome of the abdomen. Okay, so we've talked about the types of pain, the sources of pain, and now we need to discuss about assessing for pain. And this is very important, like I said, the fifth vital sign. And here on the screen are some different types of pain assessments. Long Baker faces, all of you are probably familiar with that. We'll look at a slide that has that in a minute. The numerical pain scale. The FLAC, which is the le uh, face, legs, activity, crying, and consolability pain assessment. Pain aid, which we're very familiar with, is pain assessment in advanced dementia. And the NIPS and PIPS is the nursery or pediatric pain assessments. Here is the Wong Baker faces, and you see it zero through five. Sometimes I've seen this scale, the same pictures, but it, it'll be till 10, you know, 1, 0 to 10. No hurt or hurts worse at the max. Numeric pain scale, which is the 0 through 10, worse being the possible pain. This is very helpful in assessing our patients and determining their pain amount. And the OASIS. All of us nurses are familiar with the OASIS, and we have the numbered pain scale there that we should assess, and then we also have what relieves their pain, and then what number or how low does their pain get after the pain measures, relief measures are uh, initiated. Another very important part of assessing for pain is to consider cultural differences, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And JACO is the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, uh, has put forth that standards equate the assessment and management of pain as a patient's right. So JACO understands that it is a patient's right for us to consider their um, pain level, their cultural differences, all must be considered in order for us to help our patients. We'll talk about uh, different uh, cultures, and this is going to be an overview of different cultures. Of course, everyone's an individual, but we'll talk a, a little bit about each one. Hindu uh, feel that pain, many feel that pain must be endured. The devout Hindu who senses death is near prepares for a good death by remaining conscious in order to experience the events to come. So you can see that this, the Hindu patient wants to be alert. They want to be conscious uh, during their pain. Jewish patients may voice their pain because they feel pain must be shared and validated, so they may be very verbal. They have intense verbalization, verbalization or expression, uh, and that does not necessarily mean that they have unbearable pain, but this is just their culture. 
but uh, it is because their need to, for others to listen and to validate and confirm their feeling of pain and their experience. Now, the Hispanic culture has a wide range of pain expression. Some may be quiet and slow to express their pain, while others may be very vocal. Mexican Americans tend to express pain, especially women. 76% of Hispanic Hispanics believe they should be strong and not need to take pain medications. This is very important for us to understand that as we care for our Hispanic uh, population. American, uh, African Americans report the same amount of discomforts, but their experience of pain differs. They have a higher, many have a higher intensity, longer bouts of pain, and a greater impact on their lifestyle. The difference is correlated to the health disparity, and that's a term that you may see in the literature, or differences in the health care systems, especially among minorities. And while I was researching this, I did read an article according to a study uh, of 2009 by the New York Times, African American patients who have broken their arm or leg were less likely, likely to be given painkillers in an Atlanta emergency room than white Americans. African Americans have a fear of addiction, and so this may have contributed to that, or it's just the uh, cultural diversity, disparity. 90% believe that they should be strong, and therefore they may refuse pain medications or feel that they should not need them. American Indians and Alaska Natives uh, pain is related to a past or future event and is believed to be a cause and effect relationship. They may not report their pain. They may be quiet during a pain episode or they may use Vey's description of their pain. And will not, they, many times they will not ask for pain uh, relief very frequently. So they may be quite stoic uh, when enduring pain. Pain is associated with leading diseases and causes of death in the American Indians and Alaska Natives, such as cancer, accidental injuries, and stroke. Asian Americans, they may not report pain for fear of making the health care provider feel that they are not providing adequate care. Fear of side effects from pain medications may also cause them to stop using them or use less pain medications. And as we discussed in the old, other cultures, you can see that uh, if we don't assess and take into consideration their cultural differences, then we may be hindering their relief of pain and may, they may develop chronic pain syndrome. So we must consider um, their culture. They may use, uh, the Asian Americans may use acupuncture or acupressure. That's very common in their culture. Uh, they will report pain to a family member or physician rather than the nurse, and many have mind over body thinking. We've talked about the cultures, and now let's talk a little bit about the elderly population. That's a, a vast majority of our patients, and so it would be very fitting that we discuss the elderly population at this time. Pain assessment may be complicated by a cognitive decline, multiple comorbidities, and other reluctance to report pain. Many may not understand directions. They may be related to the knowledge deficit. Hearing or vision complications could also be a, a reason that they may have a knowledge deficit. Many have the fear of becoming addicted and a common belief that they should just be tough and you know, bear the pain. As you see on the slide, I have John Wayne there, you know, many of our patients grew up when John Wayne was, you know, very important in, in the culture. So they want to be tough like that. Um, 25 to 50 percent experience pain that interferes with their activities of daily living. And many times we'll ask our patients, are you having pain? Oh, no, I'm not having pain. But then they've stopped doing the normal activities that they used to do. They 
get up and walk less um, because it hurts too much to walk. So we have to be uh, investigators when it comes to determining pain on a lot of our patients, especially the elderly population, because they don't want to admit to pain. Uh, we should monitor those on pain medications very closely. So whenever we do have an elderly patient on pain medication, we need to be watching them very closely and report any changes in their condition. Uh, elderly also have physiological changes within their body that affect their, uh, them in relation to their medication use. So by that I mean many of them have, don't have the ability or they have a decreased ability to excrete medications because their renal function has slowed. Uh, with that, they have a risk for becoming toxic or they may have undesired medication interactions because of their kidneys not excreting the medications properly. Possible um, problems with taking medications with elderly population include Increased of, uh, stomach risk, of uh, risk of stomach irritation, water overload, hypertension, headache and kidney disorders, and common with that are non-steroidal and inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Examples are ibuprofen, aspirin, Celebrex. So those are some of the common ones that can irritate the stomach and cause other complications as well. Usually there's a quicker onset of action and prolonged time of action uh, for opioids. Examples of those are Vicodin or hydrocodone containing drugs like Norco, Percocet, and mental changes and confusion with opioids or antidepressants, common antidepressants that we may see our elderly patients on are Elevil, Celexa, Lexapro, Zoloft, Paxil. I've included them all on the slides, but uh, we have to really monitor for side effects with those. Our elderly patients may have urinary retention, severe constipation, fecal impaction or obstruction. Uh, other side effects that are very uh, bad for our patients is severe dizziness, which, as we know, that has an increased risk of falling. So then falling would be fractures and then uh, pain associated with that. So we really have to monitor our patients very closely uh, when they're on pain medications. So how do we, as a home health nurse, care for our patients in, in pain? We use a diverse, we see a diverse group of patients, the elderly patients with multiple comorbidities, patients from different cultures, we must ask ourselves, should we care for all patients the same? And the answer to that is no. We shouldn't care for all patients the same. We need to consider each patient individually and each culture individually. In order to, to, to better care for our patients, we must first look at ourselves. We perceive pain based on our own culture, our own belief systems, emotions, and perceptions. We must learn about our feelings first. We got to consider ourselves and how we perceive pain and how we deal with it. Um, how do we feel others should deal with pain? We need to take a long, hard look at ourselves before uh, we can actually see our patient. Consider those emotions and thoughts, then realize how those affect our perception of others. This is very important. It's the basis of how we'll care for our patients. We must realize that we are caring for others, that they may have different perceptions of pain. Our patients will have other cultures or beliefs that we've been talking about here today. Because of those differences, we must strive to gain knowledge of other beliefs and cultural norms. And that's what this presentation is, is touched on today. We must look at those other cultures and see how they deal with pain and, and base our care on that. And, and also, we must consider all age groups. We've talked about the elderly, but we must consider all age groups within those cultures in order to provide care that is sensitive to the patient's uh, needs. In order for us to adequately treat our patients with pain, a very important aspect is to provide comfort measures. And you've heard that term, what is 
providing comfort measures, you may ask yourself. It's a phrase that is often used, but do we really know what it means? It is any action that relieves pain or discomfort, uh, that is considered a comfort measure. So any action that relieves uh, pain or discomfort. And ways that we can uh, help our patients with pain uh, start uh, by doing the simplest things. Keep the patient clean and dry. And teach our families uh, uh, of the, uh, the patient how to keep them clean and dry, how often to check them and make sure that they are dry, check their uh, under pads and diapers, pull-ups, and those kind of things. Change the sheets frequently and teach the family how to do that. Keep the sheets smooth and teach the family or the home health aide put that on our order, our care plan to be sure that the sheets are clean and smooth and also to check the bed for any objects that may be lost in the bed. You know, patients, uh, many of our patients that are in a great deal of pain spend a majority of their time in the bed and they may have pins, you know, that they're writing or doing crossword puzzles or uh, anything in the bed. We need to be mindful and check the bed for any type of object that could be underneath them and cause pain. And on the slide you'll see a very a small item may feel huge to a patient and also it could cause an injury as well as discomfort. A patient should be wearing very comfortable clothes, cotton pajamas, gowns with easy or no fuss fastening, draw sling, uh, string pants. We should avoid heavy or hot fabrics that irritates the skin, you know, like wool, that's very irritating. Uh, avoid tight or ill-fitting socks and shoes. Our environment for the patient should be very relaxing. Some of our patients may enjoy soft music or a pleasant television volume, not up too loud, uh, adequate lighting, comfortable room temperature. We should avoid you know, very loud television music, loud visitors, too many visitors. Uh, avoid overly bright lights. Of course, we've got to have lights on for safety, but avoid the overly bright lights. Other comfort measures include personal care. Our um, care persons, our home health aides, should provide warm baths, utilizing soothing soap, making sure to rinse very well. So like a bland, a bland soap is usually best, but use the specific soap and water temperature as preferred by the patient or as ordered. You know, Soft washcloths, gentle strokes, and application of lotion unless contraindicated also help to increase comfort measures. So just something as simple as a really soft washcloth, warm water to the face, you know, and to the eyes, um, gives a, a bit of comfort for our patients. The smallest thing that we often don't even consider can really mean a lot to our patients. So we should teach our families about that. And many of our home health aides will uh, we do a light massage of the back, so if we write that on our care plan or if we provide it or teach our family members how to do that, that can help keep a patient's hair clean, neat, and combed. Uh, oral care should be performed two to three times a day after each meal and more if needed. And our patients should have lip balm to avoid dry, cracked, painful lips. And we all know the feeling of having a dry lips, cracked lips, it's so uncomfortable and if we can uh, provide that bit of comfort for our patients, we should and our families should. Uh, frequent position changes will improve patient comfort, so reposition every two hours if in bed, every 30 minutes if up in a chair. I have seen some literature that even says every uh, you know, hour and a half they should reposition, so frequent position changes are very important. And then provide support to uh, painful body parts. Elevation tends to relieve pain and provide comfort. Also, we should teach our patients to conserve energy. While providing care or performing procedures, we should also teach to allow re for rest periods. So if we're providing care we should allow our patients to have rest periods, and if our family is providing care for our patient, we need to teach them 
and organize the care so that it's to optimize our patient's strengths and minimize fatigue. And then keep items that the patient uses close by, example, you know, walkers, assistive devices, medicine, telephone, needlepoint, books, and things that our patient needs to keep those close by. If it's very painful for them to get up and to try to get these items, you know, we need to have them close by for, so that it will minimize discomfort and conserve energy for our patients. And if a patient has tubes like Foley catheters, gastrostomy tubes, chest tubes, etc., we should avoid pulling the tubes. That's very painful, so we need to be very mindful of any type of tubes that our patient has. We should secure those before moving them uh, or bathing them or adjusting a patient's clothing. And if a patient's had surgery, we need to teach them to hold the area uh, like when they're coughing, say if they had had abdominal surgery, you'd want them to, to cover that area with a soft pillow for coughing or sneezing or any activity that causes pressure in that area would need to be uh, supported. As nurses, we need to inspect the skin frequently and teach our families as well and the home health aides report any abnormalities and keep a uh, patient's toes and fingernails trimmed. So for if we want to order that for our home health aides, we need to update the care plan or include it on the care plan as long as they meet the diagnosis requirements. And we should inspect the area beneath oxygen tubing at nostrils and over the ears and the back of the head and the sides of the head very carefully. Uh, some In the past, I have read articles where um, Nurses fail to assess those areas and patients develop sores there and that of course is very painful and would be untoward response. So we need to be sure to inspect those areas very well. Non-petroleum ointment may be ordered if the area under the oxygen tubing is irritated. Uh, report any dry eyes, mouth, or any other complaints to the physician as indicated because there may be some treatments that could be ordered to relieve the dry eyes or mouth or any other complaints. Other measures that we can do is encourage rest, uh, diet with adequate food and calories and fluids that uh, makes our patients more comfortable. They should do exercise as tolerated and as ordered by the physician we should provide emotional support and, and encourage interaction with the family and friends, hobbies, and other expressions. Uh, they should be allowed to verbalize any concerns or feelings that they have related to their pain or their diagnoses or outcomes. Uh, we should offer that for them. And then, of course, do cultural, have uh, culturally specific measures for pain relief. And as we discussed our cultures, you know, we need to acknowledge the pain, give adequate pain relief medication for their culture, and honor and respect each specific culture's patients' rights and wishes for comfort measures. Other measures that you may see for pain treatment or uh, pain uh, relief other than comfort measures are guided imagery and visualization exercises, prayer and spiritual practices, awareness and centering training, progressive muscle relaxation, yoga and stretching exercises. I have seen Tai Chi in some assisted living facilities. I've seen that in some literature. Tai Chi is very um, easy to do for patients and they can do it from sitting in a chair and it is a way for a patient to achieve pain relief. Massage that we touched on a little bit and healing touch are pain relief measures. Aromatherapy, arts and crafts and other means to express their feelings, music. Some of our patients have pets, love pets or want a pet that can help them. Honor, uh, humor, excuse me, humor and laughter therapy. Uh, charity or community involvement are very important ways to uh, involve a patient and count, it will um, distract them from their pain and help uh, overcome pain. TENS units, warmth such as warm bath that we discussed, warm washcloths, cool compresses or packs, 
rest, elevation of a painful site such as an extremity or medications. Also for additional or some of the comfort measures that we have discussed, they are located in VNAA. That's the Visiting Nurses Association uh, clinical procedures that we have on our website. And I just included a slide here for you so that you can see if you need to um, get different ways to help our patients with pain management, you can just go there and get uh, some good ideas. So the holistic approach for caring for our patients must involve assessment, acknowledgement, and treatment of pain. As a home health nurse, your role is invaluable. You often see the patient more frequently than they see their family or their physician. With your role comes the opportunity to make their lives much better. You are key to the overall well-being in the lives of the people in our communities. And if you see a decline or a lack of pain relief in your patients, the physician must be notified to help our patients with pain. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, or feel free to contact me uh, at the uh, lisa.martin at adph.state.al.us. And also you may refer to my references if you have any questions that, uh, or if you would like to refer to any of the references. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. We're going to continue our program now with our State Pharmacy uh, Director, Assistant Director, Nancy Bishop. Nancy? Thank you. Most pain can be treated with commonly used over-the-counter pain relievers, and we know most of these as acetaminophen or Tylenol, as we like to call it, uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, and also the combination products such as Excedrin and the Goody Powders. The more commonly used prescription medications include the hydrocodone and its combination products, oxycodone and its combination products, as well as tramadol, pregabalin, and gamopentin. Again, this is not an exclusive list, but it is the most commonly used ones. So let's talk about acetaminophen. It, uh, the brand name that we most commonly know is Tylenol. And most people do not know that there is a maximum daily dose that is uh, recommended. And we have to consider all sources when we calculate this dose. Uh, a patient should get no more than 400 milligrams in a 24-hour period. And acetaminophen is actually the number one cause of liver failure in the U.S. It's, um, it, it does have a, a box warning now that was added in 2011 regarding the uh, liver toxicity of it. And in uh, 2011, the FDA limited the amount that is in a dosage unit in prescription medicines to 325 milligrams. Some of you may remember that Lortab suddenly went off the market and it was substituted with Norco. Well, now the brand name Lortab does have the 325 milligrams instead of the 500 milligrams of acetaminophen in it. In 2011, uh, the FDA also put a warning on the over-the-counter product about allergic reactions. And I, this was something new to me. I did not realize that there are a lot of patients who are allergic to acetaminophen, and they need to be aware that it can be a combination product and the, uh, some of the pain relievers. Acetaminophen has no peripheral or anti-inflammatory activity, and it also has no effect on platelet functions. So therefore, it does have fewer hematologic, GI, and renal effects than the aspirin. And it is available now in immediate release, biphasic release, and extended release. And compared to aspirin, aspirin does have the anti-inflammatory, the antipyretic, 
and the antithrombotic properties. We should also use it very cautiously in, Ryan's, uh, in children with viral infections due to the Ryan syndrome. The dose is dependent on the indication. So a higher dose may be needed for the thrombosis prophylaxis, whereas the smaller, we call it pediatric dose, may be used in uh, cardiac patients. Aspirin, because of its uh, effects, it really needs to be used in caution when also taken in an NSAID because they have the same properties. Uh, overdose can result in renal failure, and you need to also use it in caution with bleeding disorders, uh, any kind of kidney disease, peptic ulcers, gastritis, and when taking platelet inhibitors. High dose and overuse can also cause tinnitus and hearing loss. We talked about Rye syndrome and avoiding aspirin in, in children and adults, young adults, I'm sorry, young adults and teenagers who have had or are in a viral infection. And Rye syndrome can be fatal. And the uh, symptoms of it can be confused with a lot of the other symptoms that, um, that uh, people have so it can be misdiagnosed. So anytime a patient becomes lethargic or has a change in personality, you really need to be aware of that and uh, take immediate action to the ER. The combination products, and I've just listed two here, Goody powders and Excedrin are probably one of the more commonly used ones. These two products contain both acetaminophen, aspirin, and caffeine. While it's unknown exactly how the caffeine works, it may increase the bioavailability of some of the analgesics. There is a couple of level one interactions with these combination products, and that's the MAOIs and probenicid. So we still, we do have uh, dosing limits uh, for adults and the elderly. As we talked about, the acetaminophen is 4,000 milligrams per day, aspirin is 2,080 milligrams per day, and caffeine is 520 milligrams per day. An excedrin extra strength contains 65 milligrams of caffeine. A normal, or a, uh, on the average, an eight ounce cup of coffee contains 100 milligrams, but that can vary by brand and, of course, size. Starbucks averages about 165 milligrams per day. So you can see it doesn't take much to get to that 520 milligrams per day as, as a limit on the caffeine. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or we uh, abbreviate that by calling them NSAIDs, they have a risk of serious adverse effects, and that can uh, including bleeding, ulceration, and uh, perforation of the stomach and intestines. Uh, they also can have uh, serious cardiovascular events, and they really need to be uh, used in caution. You need to evaluate your patient, and they should be given at the lowest effective dose for the shortest possible duration and they're not recommended for persistent pain in the elderly. Uh, a gentleman who's very close to me, uh, an elderly man, uh, was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, so he was put on one of the newer blood thinners. So he was told no more ibuprofen for his arthritis. It was actually pulled from the house. Well, he saw an ad for a leave, so he said, well, I'll take that for my arthritis. So we really have to educate our elderly patients on what an NSAID is. And it's not just ibuprofen, even though we use that term uh, kind of generically for NSAIDs sometimes, but they need to be aware that uh, leave and some of the, uh, the other products out on the market also are NSAIDs and need to be used in caution, with caution. As we talked about, the NSAIDs are contraindicated um, in certain um, disease states. Uh, you would not want to give it after a coronary bypass surgery. 
You want to make sure the patient is not allergic to the NSAID. And there can also be cross sensitivity to uh, someone who is allergic to the salicylates or aspirin and the sulfonamides such as Bactrim. The structure of the NSAIDs are, is similar to these two, so you, there may be some cross sensitivity. The NSAIDs have uh, a couple of level one interactions. Uh, the um, Sidofovir, which is uh, antiviral for CMV infections, which you probably won't see a lot out in the community, but uh, it, it uh, does have a level one with the NSAID, interaction with NSAIDs. And you don't want to combine NSAIDs because you'll have additive effects of the bleeding and um, other cardiovascular effects. NSAIDs do have some black box warnings. As we talked about, uh, the GI bleeding and GI perforation, myocardial infarction, and stroke. So some of the uh, NSAIDs that are out as over-the-counter products, as we talked about, are Advil, Motrin, and Modal, which are all ibuprofen. And then the Naproxen, uh, the most common OTC brand out there is the Leave. These uh, have dosing limits, so the over-the-counter products are, are limited to the 200 milligrams for the ibuprofen and the naproxen at 220 milligrams. There are some uh, prescription uh, uh, NSAIDs available. We know um, these most commonly is Celebrex, Mobic, and Feldine. The Mobic is less selective than uh, the Celebrex, so it's, uh, you'll see it probably used uh, not as much as it was before the Celebrex came on the market. And the Feldine has a similar structure to the Mobic. And all the black, black box warnings and precautions need to be used with these as well as the over-counter the pro, over -counter products. The advantage to the prescription products is that they are a single daily dose. So you don't have to, uh, there's not as much concern about the patient overdosing because they're only going to take one a day. The naproxen, as we talked about, the doses over 220 milligram are prescription as well as the ibuprofen doses that are over 200 milligrams. Okay, this is a, a good time for us to talk about the, the DEA schedules before we get into the uh, pain medicines for the moderate to severe pain. Uh, level one is there, are, there is no currently acceptable medical use in the United States. These medicines also, or these drugs also lack accepted safety and they have a high potential for abuse. Uh, drugs in this category include heroin, LSD, and marijuana. And marijuana is still scheduled uh, one by the federal government. Schedule two has also a high potential for abuse that can lead to severe dependence, but it does, they, these medicines do have an acceptable, acceptable medical use in the United States. And you would know these commonly by the hydrocodone and the oxycodone, and most of the opioids are in this category. Schedule three, uh, the Potential for abuse is less than the one or two, and these medicines may lead to moderate or low uh, psychological or physical dependence. You might remember that uh, Lortab was a Schedule three until August of 2014 when it became a Schedule two. So that is an example of uh, a, a product being uh, the FDA acknowledging that it had more potential for abuse and was moved to a different category. Schedule four is a lower potential for abuse than the schedule three. And of course the schedule five 
is a, a lower potential for a, abuse. These are primarily preparations that contain limited quantities of certain narcotics. And one thing that we have on the state level is the state has uh, scheduled some products with limited quantities of narcotics that the federal government has not. So certain cough medicines that are out there are not federally scheduled, but they are in Alabama. And the list of scheduled medications can be found on our website under the pharmacy division at adph.org. The, um, we can now talk about the opioids and um, the common ones that you probably know more about is the hydrocodone. We know that hydrocodone with acetaminophen is one of the uh, most prescribed opioids in the United States as well as in Alabama. Uh, hydrocodone extended release is a relatively new product. The first product that came out it's not a combination, it's just straight hydrocodone, is uh, Zohydra. Uh, the medical board here in Alabama has really restricted its use. It can come in, um, there's several doses out there, but uh, I think it's anywhere from 20 to 50 milligrams in a, a dosing unit, and it's a uh, once a day dosing. But you can see that uh, this would be uh, very popular on the street because the hydro does not contain any of the abuse uh, deterrents that um, some of the newer opioid products do. There is a one uh, that has been approved, and I believe it's on the market uh, just very recently, that does have the abuse deterrents in there, um, and it is an extended hydrocodone. And my understanding is that you can't crush it. Uh, it becomes um, just, just hard as a rock and will actually tear up blades if you put it in a blender. So the industry is trying to come out with opioids that uh, will help the abuse problem that we have in the United States. Uh, oxycodone comes in immediate release as well as an extended release. And it comes as a... A uh, combination of product with acetaminophen, most of you know that by Percocet. Uh, it also is a combination with aspirin, though that combination is not used as much as the acetaminophen. Morphine is another opioid. Uh, this is not an exclusive list, but when I looked at the top prescribed opioids, this is uh, what came up. Some more are the, uh, methadone and the fentanyl, which comes in a patch or tablets, meperidine, which is, you know it is Demerol, the hydromorphone, uh, codeine, oxymorphone, the tramadol, and the heroin. All of these are in Schedule 2 except for the tramadol and heroin. Tramadol is now Schedule 4. It was, um, it was not scheduled until 2014, and studies did show that it is an opioid, and that it, there is potential for abuse. So it is now scheduled for medication. Heroin is a Schedule one, and there is no acceptable medical use for that product, and it is highly addictive. It was very interesting to look at the history of opium. The earliest reference can be found in 5000 BC, so it has been around quite a while. Today's heroin uh, is less expensive than the st uh, street cost for the prescription drugs such as hydrocodone. And when I did this slide, I was told that a bag of heroin now cost about $15, whereas uh, the pills of hydrocodone and oxycodone can run from $10 to $30 per pill. Since I did this slide, I've been told that the heroin can go down to as little as $6 a bag. So you can see that it's much more cost effective for the addict to get heroin than it is the oxycodone and the uh, uh, hydrocodone. But the problem is today's heroin is 50 to 60% pure, where in the 70s it was only 10 to 
6 to 10 percent pure. So we are seeing a lot more deaths from heroin as this transition from the prescription drugs to heroin occurs. And this is something we really need to educate the public, that a little bit of heroin can go a long way, especially if um, they compare it to what was used in the 70s. One of the reasons that the cost of hydrocodone and oxycodone has increased so is the states, the governments, um, and the DEA, all law enforcement, is really looking at the prescription drug abuse and misuse in the United States. Most states, with the exception of Missouri, have a prescription drug monitoring program. All the control substances dispensed in Alabama go into our database. The health professionals can uh, search the database and they can see if a patient has received controlled substances recently. This is a great tool for them to monitor a patient's use and to um, catch what we call doctor shoppers, those that go from doctor to doctor uh, looking for controlled substances. And this person may not be just taking it. They could be selling it as well. So uh, this is a great tool, and we hope all the health professionals will use it. The opioids uh, have several contraindications. You're probably most familiar with the respiratory depression as well as the constipation. So you would not want to give the drug when there's a GI obstruction, when there's a paralytic ileus. If a patient already has respiratory depression or has status uh, masticus. The black box warnings reflect these. Uh, it mentions the respiratory depression, which can be fatal, the accidental exposure, ethanol injection, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, potential overdose of poisoning and substance abuse. The ethanol ingestion is an additive CNS effect. The neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome is a very serious issue. The babies born to mothers dependent on opioids stay in the hospital five times longer than the average stay. And though money is no um, measure of life, it can, it can cost up to five times more for the hospital to treat an opioid-dependent baby than one without it. So this is a really good place for us to take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk about some other prescription medicines used for moderate to severe pain. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We'll be, uh, take a 15-minute break. We're now going to continue our discussion on the prescription pain relievers for moderate to severe pain. Uh, Lyrica is one of those medicines that's highly advertised on the television. It's indicated for diabetic neuropathy, fibromyalgia, neuropathic pain, and uh, spinal cord inju injury, as well as post-herpetic neuro uh, neuralgia. Uh, it is a Schedule V controlled substance. And it does need to be used in caution with patients taking the ACE inhibitors. Gabapentin, or as we know it, Neurontin, is indicated uh, for the neuralgia as well as the restless leg syndrome. And Requip, you will see for restless leg syndrome. And I only include these because they are in the top 
list for pain medicines, and you will see them uh, used quite a bit in home care. You may not see triliptal used for pain, but there is an off-label indication for it. And I bring it up because there are several level one interactions with uh, this medicine. So you need to be very careful in uh, the patients that are receiving it. To shift our, uh, our discussion more to the uh, muscular uh, pain medicines for muscle spasms and any muscular um, skeletal pain, we want to talk about Soma. It is a Schedule IV controlled substance, and it is very important not to use this medicine for more than two to three weeks, at, and you should be at the lowest effective dose. And we'll talk about its, uh, its role in abuse in a few minutes. Flexoril is another uh, medicine that's indicated for muscle spasms, and it does have an off-label use in fibromyalgia. Baclofen uh, is also indicated for muscle spasms and spinal cord injury, as well as spasticity. These two medicines are not controlled, so therefore they're not in our uh, PDMP, Controlled Substance Database, and the patients uh, can have their prescriptions filled up to a year if the doctor so writes. One of the medicines uh, we see a lot for migraines is Midrin. It is a combination product. It is indicated for headache as well as migraine. You can give it with or without food, but it does have some contraindications. You would not want to give it in cardiac disease, glaucoma, hepatic disease, hypertension, uh, renal uh, disease or failure, and you would not want to give it when patients are taking MAOIs. It does have some level one interactions. Uh, you might not see these um, in your home care setting very much, but you do need to be aware of it. And Midrin is a Schedule Four. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Beer's Criteria medication list. These are medicines that can be potentially inappropriate for older patients. There's evidence of drug-related problems or adverse uh, effects. And interesting enough, all the common used pain relievers that we have discussed today can be found on one of the beers list. Any elderly patient taking pain medicines needs to have fall precautions. A discussion of pain medicines would not be complete without a discussion of their abuse and misuse. Some of the combinations that would raise a red flag are known as the Trinity and the Holy Trinity. I, this terminology was new to me, but the Trinity is a combination of hydrocodone, soma, and Xanax. Uh, the Xanax can be substituted for any of the benzodiazepines. The soma can be substituted with the flexoril or the baclofen. And another red flag would be raised if these medicines were prescribed by three different doctors. This is not to say that there's not legitimate use for this combination. It, it, there is. But it is a red flag when a patient is taking them and it needs to be considered. The Holy Trinity is a substitution of the hydrocodone using oxycodone. And again, you can substitute any of the benzodiazepine uh, for the Xanax. In 2008, there were as many deaths from drug poisoning as there were from motor vehicles. This is in part because the, of our education and use of seat belts and our, the safer cars, the airbags, and all of that. But it also, by this graph, you can see a dramatic increase in the drug po poisoning deaths between 1996 and 2008. And when we look at the, the uh, age range where these deaths occur, it's interesting to me that when you look at the opioid uh, drug use and misuse, 
the younger age groups are where most of that occurs. But when you look at deaths, there's more deaths in the 45 to 54 <coughs> age group from the opioid pain relievers than any other age group. And I don't have an explanation for this. I think it may be the additive CNS effects when they combine the opioids with things like alcohol or other CNS drugs. But I, I found this very interesting. Uh, if you look at the newer data, the, uh, uh, the um, death rate in older Americans has increased also in the over 65 age group. So how is um, our opioid problem in Alabama? It's pretty big. Uh, unfortunately, we scored first place. The national average for uh, of number of opioid uh, pain reliever prescriptions per 100 people is 82.5 in 2012. Alabama was almost 143 prescriptions per 100 people. This is not an area that we want to be number one in. There's great efforts being made by the governor and law enforcement here to help uh, this problem. The, the regulatory boards are now involved in monitoring their licensees and hopefully when the next um, uh, numbers come out, we won't be number one. So where did the patients get the medicines? 54% of patients who obtained uh, a medicine for non-medical use obtained it free from a friend or relative. This was interesting to me because I always thought it was the drug dealers that sold it, but it's not. They're, people are getting it actually free. And of this 54%, 82% got it from one doctor. So you can see that uh, the Board of Medical Examiners has reason to start regulating their licensees um, more diligently. And because the patients are able to get it um, free from a, a friend or relative. It, uh, parents need to be very aware of who, who is getting into their medicine cabinet. And so we'll talk about some ways to, um, to get rid of any leftover medicines that you might have in uh, the medicine cabinet. This is especially true for home care patients. Uh, it is uh, known that um, grandchildren or uh, the handyman that comes in to repair something will go to the medicine cabinet to see if there are any control substances there. So you, w you want to dispose of those as quickly uh, as, you, as you can. The DEA has suggested three options. Take back events, mail back programs, and collection receptacles. The take back events uh, in the past have been sponsored by the DEA in collaboration with the local, local law enforcement. But because there's two other options now, the DEA has backed out of that. Local law enforcement may continue to have those events. And I'm sure you've heard those advertised where they set up in a parking lot uh, or uh, one of the law enforcement buildings and you just you take any medicines that you have left in your medicine cabinet, give it to them, no questions asked and they dispose of them. The mail back programs are uh, packages that you can purchase in your local pharmacy and you put the medicines in there and it's mailed to a company that destroys it. Collection receptacles are a, a program the DEA has set up for local pharmacies and hospitals to have um, receptacles much like the FedEx receptacle that you would drop your package in and you would just drop your medicines in there. No one can tamper with it. Uh, a person from the disintegrating company comes in, picks it up and takes it away for destruction. The last two um, options are expensive and so most people uh, are probably not willing to do that unless there's no other option. So therefore, uh, the DEA has said that if you can't do any of these options, 
you can crush the medicines and place it in cat litter or coffee grounds and throw it in the trash. It is better to get rid of the medicine than to have it sitting there. So fentanyl patches should be flushed. And the reason for this is there's still a lot of medicine left after three days. Uh, anything that you do with that patch, you're going to get medicine on your skin or, or whatever. So the best option is to flush it down the toilet and so that no one can tamper with that patch. If you want more information about how to dispose of controlled substances, you can go to the DEA website at dadiversion.usdoj.gov and they have a whole um, question and answer page and instructions on how best to dispose of controlled substances. This is my reference list for today. So uh, I encourage you, if you have, uh, would like to know more about these studies that I've quoted, I would encourage you to go to these. And as always, you can contact me with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate it. Uh, what we're going to do now is talk about the psychosocial impacts of pain. And before we get started, I want to explain what the term psychosocial means. Um, it's one of those social worky terms that a lot of people hear about, but they don't necessarily understand. But psychosocial is a broad term that incorporates both the psychological, which is our thought processes, as well as our emotions, our, our feelings, and incorporates that with the social dimensions of a, of a person. And that involves the life activities, um, our relationships with others. So we put those two together, and those are the, the aspects of, of a person that we're looking at when we say psychosocial. You may also hear the term biopsychosocial, and that's where the biological piece is added. And in this instance, it would be pain or pain management. So you may hear biopsychosocial or psychosocial used interchangeably. Uh, within our agency, we typically use the term psychosocial. So what are the psychosocial impacts of pain? Well, we know that as humans, we're all social creatures. We have specific roles. We, we play various parts in activities. We may be a parent. We may be um, a spouse or a partner an employee, a friend, we could be a coach, a caregiver, a child, we could be all of these at the same time. And pain has a very negative impact on our social activities. Uh, this would include work, for example, if um, we have to reduce our work hours because of our pain level, then that would have a significant impact on our life. It has an, an impact on our family life, our family activities, the roles we play within the family. It impacts our leisure activities. That would be the things we do for enjoyment, our playtime. And it also impacts our social relationships, our friendships. Pain can lead to multiple losses. Um, as we just mentioned, with the loss of employment, if, re if hours are reduced, Usually that means that the um, income is reduced. If, um, if we perhaps even lose our job completely, that has a tremendous impact on our finances. It in impacts our home life and our social connections. It can make it very difficult to get out of our home, which can then lead to social isolation. And we know that social isolation has a tremendous impact on depression level and depression level impacts pain level so think about your your home care patients um, a lot of older ladies may go get their hair done on Friday they go to church on Sunday and at some point during the week they go to the doctor that is their social connection if they reach a point where they can no longer get out of their house and they're no longer able to do these things that leads to social isolation which then leads to depression, which then can lead to um, pain, increase in pain level. So it's almost like being on a merry-go-round that they can't get off of. Pain can also impact sleep levels. And when a patient doesn't get enough sleep or when we don't get enough sleep, there's memory loss, it leads to poor concentration, and it can lead to short tempers. And with short tempers, 
a lot of, a lot of times we see caregivers who just have to take a break. They need to get away. Um, they don't, they're not able to stand around and be yelled at frequently. Uh, none of us can. And that in turn can lead back to social isolation. So we're back on that merry-go-round <laughs> again. These oftentimes will lead to a loss of confidence for our patients and also will lower their self-esteem. Now, the psychosocial impact on work, let's go back to that for a minute. Being gainfully employed is perceived as having a positive impact on life. Um, I've heard it mentioned that most of us like to live indoors, eat food, and have clothes. And to do that, you have to have some money, some source of revenue. So when our hours are reduced or we completely lose our job, that has a negative impact. Being gainfully employed, though, also consumes a lot of energy. Most of us feel a little more tired at the end of the day or at the end of our work shift than we do at the beginning. Energy that is consumed at work leaves us with less energy available to take care of our health, and this has a, a negative impact on pain. So we see pain levels will rise um, the more a person works. So with a, the loss of job or, or um, not working as many hours tends to lower life satisfaction. It increases depression, which then increases pain levels. Um, again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but that's because we're, we're on that merry-go-round. So those who leave work due to pain tend to be engaged in fewer activities, which leads to a higher incidence of depression. That just makes sense. Um, if they're not able to work, they're not able to do the other things that they used to enjoy. Pain also will restrict participation in family and life roles. Um, a parent may no longer be able to be as engaged in raising their children as they were prior to the pain. Perhaps managing a household could be negatively impacted. If, if there has been a job loss or a reduction in hours, then there's less money to pay the bills. If there's pain, there may not be the ability to maintain the house the way that they have always been accustomed to doing. It also has a, a negative impact on intimate relationships. Um, sexual relationships are negatively impacted. So when pain interferes with these life roles, then significant psychological distress is the result. The most important aspect of improving a patient's pain level other than with with the drugs would be social support. Having social support, whether that comes from family members or whether that comes from um, friends, church members, anybody, having that support tends to have a positive impact on depression as well as a positive impact by lowering the level of pain. However, the opposite is also true. So perceived negative support or lack of support can increase pain levels and depression. Studies have shown that people with significant pain levels participate in fewer leisure activities. This tends to be especially true among individuals with lower educational attainment. We know that a lower educational attainment tends to lead to lower socioeconomic status. So with less uh, resources available, there's less money to be able to play, if you will. So that does seem to have a, a very negative effect on pain levels. Loss of participation in these leisure activities also seems to increase the level of pain and the symptoms of depression. Again, we're back on that merry-go-round. If depression symptoms increase, it seems that pain levels will also increase. So the role of leisure activities in maintaining or restoring psych psychological well-being is significant. Our patients need to be able to do things they enjoy. They need to be able to be a part of activities that they've always enjoyed and been a part of. So what are some approaches, psychological, psychosocial approaches, I'm sorry, to pain management? 
Psychosocial factors that lead to poor pain management include catastrophizing. And if you've been in health care for five minutes, you've probably met a, a patient who catastrophizes. This is a patient who, um, whatever event is occurring with them, it is the absolute worst event ever in the history of medical events. Uh, there's also those who catastrophize by pro uh, projecting whatever's happening to all future events. For example, if they're trying to stand up out of a chair and it's very painful, they may fall. For some people, it is an indication that they will be dying very soon. They catastrophize that event. For others, they will assume that Every time they try to stand up out of a chair, there will be pain and they will fall. Therefore, they can never stand up out of a chair again. Um, anxiety and fear also uh, go along with catastrophizing. Uh, we all know of, of patients who, for whom the sky is falling. Their glass is always half empty and the part that's there, the liquid that's there, is probably poison. Uh, those are the patients who will absolutely suck the life out of their caregivers, as well as um, their medical providers. Some of them also um, exhibit signs of helplessness. They feel like they have no control over their pain. They are a victim of their pain, and, and they therefore behave as a victim. These all have very bad outcomes. Um, people who experience this have negative outcomes with their pain management. There's also a tendency for increased alcohol consumption and or abuse of controlled substances, as we just heard. On the opposite end of that spectrum are the psychosocial approaches to pain management that are effective. This involves self-efficacy. That is the opposite of the um, catastrophizing person, the person who seems helpless, the victim. Self-efficacy is a person who feels in control. They have control over their destiny. They are able to control their pain. Um, they won't let the pain get them down. Pain coping strategies, we heard um, Lisa talk about a few of those. And uh, we'll talk about a couple more. But also, the patient must be ready to change. One psychosocial intervention that's used quite a bit with a lot of behaviors is cognitive behavioral therapy um, and also coping skills training. This has proven to be very effective with depression, with improving pain symptoms. It, it's also effective with obsessive compulsive behaviors and with eating disorders, etc. So this is one strategy that, that we see works very well hand in hand with um, a pain management regime. Support groups, being able to see and talk with other people, not only does it alleviate the problem of social isolation, but it also gives our patients the ability to see other people who have been through what they're going through, have found a way to manage their pain, and give them ideas and hope that they too can conquer that pain. And changing activity patterns, sometimes just getting out of the house, um, changing positions in a chair, going from inside the house to the front porch, even if they never leave their home, but they're going into a different location. It can lighten the mood and it can also reduce pain levels. Changing cognitions, this is a part of, behavior, of cognitive behavioral therapy. The, the premise behind that is if we change the thought processes, if we can get off that negative spiral, then behaviors will ultimately change. What we think is what we do. So recognizing and reducing those negative thoughts tends to have a positive impact on depression and a positive impact on level of pain. Um, Lisa mentioned the attention diversion techniques. Guided imagery is one. We, we all have that place, that happy place we like to go to. Um, relaxation techniques, usually progressive relaxation techniques, have been proven to be very effective both in alleviating depression and therefore pain. Our um, educational programs. Sometimes just simply understanding the cause of the pain helps to improve it, as well as understanding that it's, it may not be 
as bad as it first seems. Um, the severe headaches may not be terminal. Um, there are some people who are, are very quick to assume that, and that tends to make their pain levels a lot, a lot worse. So in conclusion, a lot of studies have shown that individuals experiencing significant pain do not feel that their health care providers fully appreciate the psychosocial impact of the pain and therefore do not provide information to meet these needs. So it's up to us as providers to make sure that we not only address the bio part, but also the psychosocial aspects. There's also um, evidence that psychosocial approaches enhance the medical regimes. It improves coping and self-efficacy and reduces psychological distress and depression. It's very effective with um, reducing hypertension as well. So a lot of times if we can improve the psychosocial issues that the patient may be enduring, we can improve their pain level. Uh, this is the, the citation for, and the resources that, that were used. And now I'm going to open it up. Do we have any questions, Jackie? Um, no, but um, please do send in any questions that you have by uh, email or by telephone. I believe the number will be on the screen uh, either now or shortly. I do have some points of discussion and some questions mm -hmm. um, um, that I'd like to go back to. Um, starting with you, Nancy. Um, could you touch on tolerance? Um, I know you talked about with Lortabs and, and the hydrocodone being one of the number one uh, issues in Alabama. I mean, we're number one on another bad list, yes. um, almost double what the, the national right. rate is there for um, the number of prescriptions. I know in my practice, um, um, both within the health department as well as the other things that I do clinically, I see that as a huge issue. Uh, what about what about the issue of tolerance related to pain medications? Well, opioids uh, do have a progressive tolerance, and that is one of the reasons that we're seeing more deaths there, because the patient becomes more and more tolerant, so the doses it takes more and more to give them that high. So they just keep increasing the dose uh, to meet that tolerance, and you know soon they go into respiratory depression. Uh, Unfortunately, um, with the abuse potential of the drug, there, are, there is tolerance. And uh, it can be uh, very difficult to take a patient, to lower the dose or take the patient off of an opioid. It's, it's a long process. It needs to be managed medically. Uh, and it, the caregiver as well as the patient needs to be explained what is happening and what to expect with that. Some patients that have been in severe pain and then they, for years, and so they've built up their tolerance, and then they go for surgery and all of a sudden, they're really not in pain, but they feel like they need their medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can really get into trouble. Uh, we're hoping that the, um, the extended release hydrocodones that are coming out on the market now will allow for the immediate release opioids like Lortab to not be used in a chronically, um, a patient who has chronic pain because those are really for acute short-term pain, whereas the, the uh, extended release hydrocodones as well as the long-acting oxycontins are more appropriate for that patient who has just chronic long-term pain. Mm -hmm. You bring up a good point there about the acute pain versus chronic pain. Right. Um, so what you're seeing is the trend there for the uh, industry, the pharmaceutical industry, to take some responsibility to, to create some medications that are more appropriate right. for one type of pain than the other. So, of course, that behooves us as the clinicians to, uh, whether we're prescribing nurse or, or just a, a nurse that is um, managing the care and helping the family deal with that, to kind of understand the difference. Sure, and that's, that's, it's very important mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to understand. And I know the um, Medical Association is doing a lot of education with physicians to provide them with guidelines on how to treat a long-term patient versus acute pain. Again, that, that is so on target. Um, I have um, 
uh, an acquaintance, and, and the discussion the other day was about um, the parents' long-term medication use who is now, you know, in pain, has been in chronic pain, but then they're now the doctor is concerned about the effects of the long-term use of some of the um, opioids. Right. And um, so I think this is a, is a huge issue for our population in the home care patients. They may have been, uh, I remember years and years ago back, you know, long time ago when Valium was out and everybody got a Valium, you know, and they were right. giving them out. And now you, you, I don't even know if you can even get one <laughs> anymore. But, you know, because everybody understood then that the, the, that was a, a benzodiazepine that was just not appropriate in most cases. And so you don't see it used as a... a uh, prescription in the home anymore. Yeah, unfortunately, Xanax has sort of taken its place. Yeah, yeah, we have so, some others. Clonopin, yeah, Clonopin right. is another one that is, can be used with that long half life. But uh, but we kind of see, you know, so there were other drugs to come along and take right. the place. But when you had an older patient, I remember a period of years there where there was, you know, if I had an, an elderly patient, then they may still be on a particular right. drug that they had started years, years ago, ago right. and they don't want to give it up and and that sort of thing to move maybe to something that's a little more safe that's as right. well as effective. That's right. Um, I, I know in my own practice, like I said, I've seen where the tolerance can be, uh, whether it was in, a, in an alcohol and drug um, setting, uh, re, uh, rehab setting, or whether it was in a psychiatric hospital or in the acute hospital setting, I've seen where, you know, a patient could just uh, be on amount of medication that was just, mind-boggling to me. I mean, yeah. enough that would, you know, kill an elephant if you gave that amount to them, but that tolerance is just... Right. Um, and that's built up over probably years. Yes, yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, to have somebody be able to take 800 milligrams of even Lortabs um, mm -hmm. or, or even morphine, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's like, it sounds like, how could anybody do that? And you really have to look at that acetaminophen level. Yes. You know, in the past it's been 500 milligrams per pill of the lower tab now it's 325 but for a patient who's taking a lot um, liver failure uh, is is a real possibility mm -hmm. and patients really need to be educated that um, the lower tabs do contain acetaminophen which can be very toxic in high doses yeah that was actually my other point that I wanted us to discuss because I see that as a huge huge issue because most patients are not really aware yeah. that hey there's Tylenol in there so if we've right. got if we've got a double the amount of Lortab being prescribed in Alabama we got a lot of people who are taking way too much Tylenol mm -hmm. might not be to that uh, what did you say? I think it's the a 4,000 4, 4, 4, is, is the limit. Right. They might not be up to that level, but they're taking a whole lot more acetaminophen than they need. Well, you know, in the past when it was 500 milligrams in a lower tab, it didn't take, t it only took eight yeah. to get to the 4,000 limit. And that's if they didn't take anything else with Tylenol in it. If they didn't, you know, take regular Tylenol or something or a goody powder or mm -hmm. uh, excedrin. So uh, we do have a lot of education uh, to do in the, in the, uh, pub, for the public. Um, but for uh, Tylenol overdose to be the number one liver failure cause, I was yeah. surprised at that. That's pretty amazing right. um, to me as well. Um, but, but, you know, knowing that it is such an issue, um, uh, with with the um, um, the lower tab, mm -hmm. you know, because people just don't realize. But I just never would have thought that it would have been the number one reason for liver right. disease as now well. That, now that they have decreased the amount in the prescription drugs to 325, it would certainly help. Mm -hmm. But their over the counter products are still available in the 500 milligram dose. So um, I was kind of surprised the FDA didn't. Uh, lower that also, but they only lowered the prescription combinations. That's right. We can still purchase the extra strength right. Tylenol or acetaminophen, which is a, a basic 500 milligram. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, you know, a lot of people used to, we, we always used to take what? Two aspirin. Right. You know, take two aspirin and call me in the morning kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you take two Tylenol of two the 500 milligrams, and you've already taken okay. a thousand milligrams mm -hmm. right. for the day. 
Uh, so even if we're just talking about Tylenol and not even a combination, we could see a very serious overdose sure. pretty quickly with someone who was, um, say, maybe taking, they think that they could take two tablets right. four or five times a day. And, and the arthritic patient is probably the one you want to watch out for mm -hmm. because they're, they're in pain and an older patient probably can't take an NSAID for that. So they're going to take that um, Tylenol arthritis, I think is what mm -hmm. it's called, or it's generic, which is high dose acetaminophen. That's right. So if they take several a day, they're going to hit the 400, uh, 4,000 milligram yeah. limit. And older patients also cannot metabolize mm -hmm. as well as younger patients. Mm -hmm. So it may stay in their body longer. Mm -hmm. Um, you did mention, too, I, I wanted to make a point about this, about any of our patients who mm -hmm. are elderly um, and they are also on any pain medicine, then that is automatically um, enough criteria to have them on fall precautions. So right. uh, clinicians, please may be aware of that, that that would be a reason that you'd want to put somebody automatically on fall precautions and teach the family about that and the patient if they're on any kind of pain medication uh, with our elderly population. Um, I think we do have a question here. Let me pull that up. While she's doing that, I, I do have a question about the liver damage. How long does it take for that liver damage to start showing up? Is it a fairly rapid process? Well, I think it, I, I don't know exactly, but I would think it would be different for different patients because we're all we all metabolize medicines differently, and so, um, and we're all genetically different. So I think it would really depend on um, how much you're taking and for what period of time, and also how genetically you're made. I know I've seen a lot of, of young people who are on Lortab, for example, mm -hmm. for injuries from maybe a car accident or something like that, and I was just concerned about the long-term effects on them. And their livers. Right. And, and again, you would not want to use Lortab for chronic pain. Right. So they need to come off the Lortab as quickly as possible. And if they do have chronic pain, go on to one of the extended release opioids. Um, Nancy, the question has come in uh, through the email Are the recommended doses variable by the patient's weight? I did not find that. Um, the uh, FDA has listed it just the same for everybody. Okay. Uh, other yeah. than pediatric, uh, of other course. Other than pediatric, of course. Um, the, um, the aspirin, the dose, effective dose, varies so much by diagnosis and what you're really treating that, um, you know, you just have to be careful in how much aspirin you're giving because it really can cause ulcers mm -hmm. and bleeding ulcers and so um, but I, I didn't find it based on weight. Okay thank you. Um, a couple of other things um, that I, um, Renee, um, you mentioned something about the depression and pain going together. I know that of course, depression is often an issue for any of our home health patients for various reasons. Can you speak to that in a little bit more related to um, our home care patients? Well, and our home care patients, again, have a lot of issues with social isolation. So there again, that tends to lead to depression. Uh, depression tends to exacerbate the feelings of pain. So there really is an increase between depression and pain and oftentimes if we can treat the depression we may even be able to control the pain whether that uh, depression is treated with medications or a combination of medications and psychotherapy mm -hmm. it does seem to have a positive effect on the pain level mm -hmm. so I'm hearing too I'm thinking in terms of education not only for our patients but but for our uh, caregivers so that they understand that you know, mama may be depressed and they get kind of angry with mom. You know, she just needs to, you know, get over it or I wish she would do this or that. And then there's pain. But, you know, helping them as well to, to get the connection uh, between the depression and the pain level, I think, is a very important point that we should uh, consider uh, with our patients and, and dealing with our um, families as well. 
I don't know if there's any more questions. Okay. Is there anything you guys would well, want to add have, before we close? I just have a comment or a question for Renee. You talked about the caregiver and their role in manage, helping manage mm -hmm. that pain. But so many times the caregiver mm -hmm. needs a caregiver. That's right. And That's exactly uh, right. you also talked about support groups. Are there support groups for caregivers? There are a lot of those? support groups. Uh, particularly for Alzheimer's. You'll see a lot of support groups for Alzheimer's uh, caregivers. Um, a lot of times hospitals will run those support groups because, it, again, it consumes so much energy. Caregiving sure, takes so much time and so much energy, and it is a labor of love, but it mm -hmm. is a labor. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. I think one of the things, too, of course, is to help our caregivers realize, provide them all the support we possibly can, and there's so many ways to do that, and thank you, Renee, for bringing up a lot of those things, as well as the things that Lisa pointed out with our caregivers uh, in support, but also that this is probably not going to last forever. Uh, it is extremely important. I know that we've all, those of us who've been in home care for uh, a, even a short while, we realize that our caregivers are the ones sometimes that can go down. Perhaps they're the ones that are uh, over-medicating even themselves to cope with the situation, and their pain is going up because of their stress going up. Um, but we, we do need to look for ways to support um, them it, to um, not only care for the patient, but also to care for themselves. That's an extremely important aspect of what we do. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, is there anything else you guys want to add for today? I, I, there may be some questions that's not really related to this topic, but we've had that spice issue in Alabama. Okay. It, do you mind me mentioning in a couple of minutes um, about Please. that? Um, spice is termed mar uh, uh, synthetic marijuana. It is not marijuana at all. Um, I have recently learned that they'll take a green leafy substance and then spray the drugs on there. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, um, just like you would spray your roses for insects, they kind of spray this green leafy stuff. So there's varying amounts of drugs that can get down and heaven forbid the uh, cell phone ring and they just hold it in one place for a while. So that's why spice is so dangerous. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're getting. You don't know how much. You don't know what products they've put in there. Uh, I've been told that warfarin is in there. Well, obviously, oh. warfarin is what we use in rat poison as oh. well as, you know, so you really don't know what you're getting. So if you know anyone who is considering or is using spice, please get them help because it is a very, very dangerous Yes, it is. Drug. Yes, it is. And again, I've seen, you know, we had an increase in Alabama just, what, right. two weeks ago? And we had, right. um, I've forgotten the numbers, but it was a dramatic increase of ER visits related to spice. And we even Seven had some deaths. deaths. Yes, I think there were about three, five deaths. Three, so. Yeah, about five deaths here in Alabama just within um, this last month in between May and April and May. Well, I think um, we've had a really great discussion today. I hope you all have enjoyed it. Remember all the things that you need to do to get your CE credit. And uh, we will be having more exciting programs uh, on the Alabama Public Health Network soon. Um, just look at the um, website, and um, we hope to see you again. Thank you.